Thank you very much, Fred. So, just to clear the record, I am very, very involved in uh, Cape Town still. <laughs> and uh, as you will know, I'm from the now boarding team, and um, I spend just about every day communicating with them. And it's a brilliant thing and a nice test for me to, to kind of see how this remote thing could work. Um, but South Africa is still my passion and I'm very interested to see how we can continue to grow the design community here. And Heavy Chef is a part of that and I feel incredibly lucky to be here tonight because some 12 years ago when I was a very young designer in, a, in my first agency, I got an email from Fred, it was a group email, and he had, they had just published the latest um, version of the Heavy Chef website. And he had sent out an email asking for some feedback from the community. And I took a look at it online, and I saw potatoes and carrots and onions all across the header. And I was like... So I, I, I decided to write to Fred. I said, Fred, um, kind of feels like fruit and veg city. And um, we're supposed to be this digital community. But he took it very well and he said he takes everyone's feedback um, in, in, into thought. And um, I think it's lucky that there's water under the bridge now and I'm here tonight to, uh, <laughs> to speak to you. So I want to start, um, start my um, conversation with you just to take a moment to think about the world right now. And I think what Pierre was, was touching on was um, a very special point. And I feel personally completely blown away by the amount of media that we are um, sort of have become used to consuming today. And we, it's sort of from social to news, across all platforms, all devices, we are um, sort of drowning in this media. And obviously as a designer, it's our job to make, uh, help, help brands communicate and, and, and stand out. And I, I kind of feel like it's, it's never been harder as this is just, we, we're kind of, never seen this kind of media before. Um, so it sort of begs the question, what does it take to get noticed in this world right now? I'm okay. <laughs> so, as designers and as businesses and as tech producers, we often aspire to the large tech giants of the world, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons. Locally, we have some players as well that we look up to and see the amazing things that they have achieved. They've been using data incredibly well. They've been creating their own frameworks that they're even willing to share with the world as best practice to create applications that are really easy to use quicker to build, and from that, they, they, they sort of, they become these trendsetters that we look up to, that we respect. And by looking up to and respecting them, we can achieve great results. There's, there's no doubt about that. Through all this data and learning, we can achieve great things. But it kind of feels like We've all got access to it these days. We've, we've all got access to analytics. We're all starting to understand our users. We're all getting the same information back. And it begs the question, sort of, it, it, it paints this picture of the, the playing fields have been leveled. 
And we, in the, we have this desire to, we have this need to still stand out because no longer is just big data or sticking to best practice enough to stand out from the crowd. So what it does is it puts us at risk of all offering very similar products, very similar services, and very similar looking applications. I don't know if you've also noticed that, but um, it, it's um, in a sort of, in a, in, a, in, a, in a flooded market with everything being based on these premises, we tend to look the same today. So, that was actually the statement that I wanted to say. <laughs> We're all trying very hard to look the same. It's a kind of weird situation that we found ourselves in. And especially from the designer's side, we can see it even amongst ourselves that there's this, we have to sometimes take a very hard look at what we are creating and understand that, wow, but this has definitely been done before and this is definitely starting to look like something else that we've seen out there. So, the idea behind what I want to speak to you about tonight is about creating memorable experiences. It's about creating something that's different that can engage the user in a different way. I think we need to go back to these more tactile things of how we can surprise and delight users as opposed to just feed them based on what information and data is telling us to feed them. We need to engage them in a way that they actually remember us. Because if we achieve just that little part, they'll actually tell the next person about us. And if I had a penny for every time the client came to me and said, um, I want to be the Uber of whichever industry. And it's not really that they want to have an app like Uber. It's that they want to achieve what Uber achieved. To create something that grabs their attention and cre creates a recurring enjoyment and habit in an online application or a digital application that is so good and so enjoyable and personal that you keep coming back to it. Uber could easily, in their first iteration of the app, have given us a list of cars close by, had those four or five menu items at the bottom of the app, just like Apple tells us should be there. And that could have easily been the first version of the Uber app. But they approached it from a different angle. They focused on one thing and chose that one feature and hid all other features away. And that created a direct, easy to use and pleasant experience for the user. It was one of the first apps to just open to a map and we had this sort of wow feeling of, wow, look at all the cars driving around um, that are there for me to select from. So they, they are playing more in the space of the emotions and the real needs of what the user wants. They're looking a bit further than just offering the stock standard navigation that we are taught to use as best practice. So, I started my career as a designer and we learned the good things of design, the space, the composition, the typography, the mood that we portray. We, we learned to communicate visually. And then along came the digital revolution as we know it today. And designers sort of got hit from the side by search engine optimization conversion optimization, A-B testing, and data analytics. They were amazing, powerful tools that we had to learn and we had to embrace. 
And we did. And products got better because we embraced those things. I think just to focus on some of them, like data, I had a very interesting experience um, where a client asked us to create a new sign-up flow for a very big uh, online marketplace. And they gave us the old form and said, well, you know, what can you guys do? So we took a look at it and it looked very old-fashioned and it looked like there was, you know, 20 questions all in a row, one after the other. So we thought, okay, well, let's, you know, let's simplify our brief here. We're going to create some space. We're going to create segments. We divided up the form into logical steps, added a skin of a new modern slick user interface, and we brought a, a feeling of the brand across into that form. And that was instinctually what we thought as designers we should do to improve that form. It got published online, and they ran an A-B test. And the old form performed better, marginally. But it's still a bit of a hard, a bitter pill to swallow as a designer when this old thing that looks like it was from the days of Internet Explorer has just beaten your um, fancy new slick material um, user interface. So you have to sort of take a moment to step back and, uh, and, and, and sort of try and understand that data. And that's really the point ar around data is it's been measured in a certain sequence that you asked to measure it in, and it's not taking into account a lot of the other things that we need to take into account when we look at a user journey or an experience online. So what, what were the feelings and emotions within that user before they even came onto that website? And what about their recurring connection to this brand. So data can't measure exactly there. They can tell us that the form might be doing better than the other one, but we are going to connect with this brand. And as Pierre suggests, in the future, I believe that this is going to be in a more and more real way. Because we are bombarded by the pure statistics and numbers, and we want a more true connection. Search engine optimization was another interesting time for designers. We would create beautiful landing pages for our clients, and they would incorporate this new knowledge we had of conversion optimization. And we would then sort of get to the final part of the design and then the SEO partner would say, look, we need 300 words of keyword copy to go along on the same page. And you kind of ask yourself, well, okay, I don't want to be too proud of a designer, so we, you know, we'll, we'll put it in there. But the, the more important question is, what are we creating? Are we creating applications that Google's bots can read or are we creating applications for humans? Now, we all want the products to be searchable, that's for sure. But we've got to get smarter. I mean, we've got to be able to create these applications that don't need to bombard us with additional information that we don't need. My business partner made a very good reference to the fact when you sort of rock up at a bar and you meet someone, you don't give them a list or a full biography of yourself. You, know, you start with the basics. You start with an introduction or maybe we'll have a drink. So we don't need all the peripheral information just yet. We want to learn that information step by step. But search engine optimization says we need to have it on the home page. And I've got a little bit of a problem with that. I totally respect the search engines, but I would love to see us moving towards building these more real experiences. And another fantastic tool that designers have been able to latch on to has been the operating system or frameworks that the mobile um, powerhouses has provi have provided us with. So 
we, we, we got human design from Apple, and we got material design from Google. And these have been fantastic guidelines to work with. I studied both of them. I find them incredibly thought out, thorough, and they're very useful tools for designers. But at what risk is the question I have. Because we tend to then look at these and have such respect for these um, players that we're creating, again, very similar applications. If Apple says the best way to do a menu bar is five along the bottom, Android said it was five along the top, then Android said actually it's five along the bottom. But we hold them in high regard, so we follow suit. And we need to remember that they're guidelines. We need to, as designers and business entrepreneurs, remember that we can break that norm, that we can use that as a starting point, but we must depart and go further than that. So, create, making money within our businesses is a key. And I've always sort of played with this idea of the creating a sales funnel, which will allow us to convert. We know that the sales funnel works. You, you might be familiar with this, as the awareness, interest, decision, and action. A very logical procedure, process to create conversion. And what we are looking for as we strive to stand out and create applications that are more engaging and memorable is to bring up is to focus on the part that is experience. So we need to understand the motivations of why the users want to interact with us. We need to take into consideration that they have emotions around certain products and services that we offer. The influences that may persuade them to buy the product or not. And lastly, just natural desire. We need to be more sensitive to the emotional side of what our businesses and applications have to offer. So, what I believe and what I sort of have started working with is a different, a, a simplified approach to um, creating experiences. And the very first part where we start when we create um, when we look at MVPs or business challenges from, from businesses is, okay, well, let's make sure we understand the business goals. There's, there's, no, there's no two ways about that. We need to list at least three and really um, focus on that. And then what we do is we park it. We put it completely to the side. And we look at everything from the user's point of view. And we take exactly that process where we were looking at the business goals and we apply it without... Fear or favor from exactly the user's point. What do they want? And what you get when you manage to take a balance and a combination of those two is something that I find very, very powerful. And it's a valuable experience. You want to create value for both the business and for the user. I've always claimed to be the person in the room who cares most about the user. That doesn't mean I don't care about the business, but it's the ability to understand those two at the same time, which empowers you to create more meaningful experiences. So, I think um, it wouldn't be right to talk about memorable experiences without sharing a few ideas that I've just gathered over the years from just doing exactly what I do. And creating these experiences um, in, a, in a digital environment. Trust is a very interesting one. And I think it's a very good to have it first. It's the starting point. You have to, before you speak to your users, you have to Understand what your company stands for. As far down as your company culture, the people 
that are creating experiences for those users need to already be in this feeling of experience. They need to be having a good experience that they can perpetrate that further onto their users. There's also a big thing around privacy these days. So building from the ground up your policy on creating trust around how you use your data and what your intentions are is going to be very important as we go forward in this world flooded with media. Which leads directly into the next point, which is transparency. People will ask more questions as we go further and further into digital applications. They want to know more. And I think the whole crypto and blockchain community has been a very interesting step in this direction. One of the big advantages or interesting opportunities with blockchain is around transparency, around creating applications that we can see the flow of money. You can even simplify transparency down to the fees that you charge on, for example, a currency conversion. People feel better when they feel you're not trying to take advantage of them. For me, it's an intricate part of the experience. Gamification is, of course, a very trendy word in the business right now, and I think for very good reason. It is a fantastic tool that will only become more and more integrated into what we build as experiences. It's all about creating habit. So we create more interest and excitement out of what is otherwise could be very mundane processes. The onboarding process, the sign-up process for an application is a great example. We can create more interaction and engagement and excitement, fun, whatever it is, by simply giving high fives, giving updates, or speaking back to the customers as though they're real, so that they don't feel that they are stuck in a digital world. They need to feel like they are stuck in a process that is tailored for them and is something that they can enjoy. Um, gamification is obviously has some great little things that you can do with leaderboards, points, rewards that are tiny little chips that create this feeling of, our of, of, of satisfaction that a user would be willing to return the next day to use the app. It's something to really keep your eye on. Then there's storytelling. And um, I think we've touched on this before. I think when, when Fred first asked me about storytelling and design, I was kind of like, well, you know, we, we were taught as designers to tell stories. And we must not forget that. What we are doing when we create user journeys is we're creating stories. And stories can be more real. Stories can be more interesting. And we shouldn't let go of the power of what a story can create. Um, I think sometimes when we see people trying to talk about a product and you have to say, well, it's actually, it's the story of the entrepreneur and the process that he went to in creating that product, that's the interesting part. So look for the nuances and look for the interesting points that we can build on to do good storytelling. It's, it's, it's another way of creating a narrative that, and, and a sort of personalization in the applications we build that can bring the user back because they feel you, you have their attention. Uniqueness, this one's very close to my heart in that I feel like and this is sort of the crux of what I'm sharing here, is I feel like we are all starting to create very predictable ex experiences. 
And we must remember that these are brands at the end of the day. And we start brands off with its unique color palette, unique typefaces, icons, and we create this starting point of something that is supposed to be unique. And then we get inside a mobile screen which is just big enough for the Apple navigation and a red bar because we use the red color. And that's not enough. We have to look at ways to stand out. And I hate to use this example, but I use this example, you the, the Tinder app. So what Tinder did was incredibly powerful and successful. Again, similar to Uber, they focused on one feature within the app. And they hid, not completely hid, but they put to the side all the other features. It was the core focus was the one feature. And then they invented a new way to navigate. And no other dating app, probably even any other kind of app, had thought about this kind of way to navigate. It was fun, engaging, and it just made sense. It suited their product and created something that was unique. And the story of Tinder just continues from then. They were able to add all the other features later. It was the starting point. They were brave enough to start with something that was so different. So back to data. I don't want to bash data. Data is our friend. And it's changed design and it's changed the way I design. And it's incredibly important. Because it's a look back at what we have created and a validation of if it works or if it doesn't. And as designers, we cannot be too proud. We must learn from the data and continue to build, to iterate, to build a better product. But we must not let it stump our creativity. And that's the key here. So I've been working, as Fred mentioned, for some fintech companies. I mean, the one's not really fintech. It's a Swiss bank. So it's, uh, it's the fin without the fun. And um, they, um, they asked me to look at their onboarding process for a new app they had. And so I joined the first workshop and I said, okay, well, the one thing I know about banks because I've worked on projects like this in South Africa is they've got a lot of regulation, so they need a lot of information to onboard a new user. And so I said, I think this is a very good starting point. Let's start with this timeline, this long timeline and let's see how we can improve the user's experience through filtering information, through creating a more gamified experience, make it a bit more fun. And they stopped me right there. And they said, Jacques, well, um, research tells us that people in Switzerland don't mind spending a long time signing up for Swiss banking products. And I thought, well, we have to learn from the data. And then I thought, what would have happened if I was standing in front of Steve Jobs in a workshop and I said to him, Steve, because we were on a first name basis by then, <laughs> we don't really need to worry about the sign up process or sorry, the, 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 the setup process when someone buys a new iPhone. Take it out the box. If they take 15 minutes to do it, Research tells us they don't mind because they're looking forward to the product maybe. And then I wonder if I would still have a job with Steve at that point. And the reason I mention him is because this is what he said. A lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And that's always stuck with me. He was that kind of a person who was willing to use the data, but to also break away when he wanted to push the envelope. We should never stop challenging ourselves in that regard. Because there is always a better way to do things. And if you see the innovation in other areas, maybe in Tesla and the electric car, and then you come back to your job to build an application, you must remember that there's always a better way to do these things. 
And who says that Google and Facebook and Apple have the better solution? Because we are the designers that can come up with these things, and sometimes we're just too scared to do it. So, as a call to action for businesses, designers, and engineers, I want us to build products, to not just build products, but to build experiences. So what that means is we need all the tools. We've got all the tools. We all have access to them. And by using these tools, it is the foundation to build good products. But if we apply our minds and we design and we create, we have the power to build great products. So with that, I hope that I've inspired some sort of call to action to think about what we promote as these applications that we build. And if I haven't, then I hope you at least enjoyed the jacket. <laughs> Thank you very much.